coming up on episode 38 of Anchor Persons. Oompa Loompa, doopity do. When your workers organize, what do you do? I guess this time the red dot wins. Me ouch. The Nabisco chicken and a biscuit Trisket Ritz picket. Holy forking fridge balls! And what does the Fermi paradox have to do with building blasters? Stay tuned to learn. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Anchor Persons. From the south and east of the Northwest, the land of trees and rivers, currently on fire, it's Anchor Persons with Gene and Greg Person. Featuring sports, emotional weather, food crime, the podcast shopping network, and more. Anchors weigh you down. Cut loose with your news. Here's Gene and Greg. Good evening, wherever you are, whoever you are, and welcome to Anchor Persons. I'm Gene Person. And I'm Greg Person. No relation. Anchor Persons is a news show for people who don't like news shows by people who don't like news shows. And a hearty welcome to new listeners and existing listeners alike. Yes, welcome. It's not a cult. Not yet. It's not a cult. We're getting there, though. We wear glasses. That that means we can't be cult leaders. We can only be scientists. We are scientists. Our glasses are thick. Dummy thick. <laughs> Let's get into the... Dummy thick. Let's get into tonight's story beats. A man visiting a bank in Eastbourne, Sussex, had such bad penmanship that when he handed the note to tellers, they couldn't read it, and he left. Sometime later, a manager determined that he was trying to rob the bank, and police were called. The man was arrested, but if he does get a sentence, nobody will be able to read it. It's the perfect crime. Now, before I begin, I want to stress that every word of the following is true, and it is the only information we have. In the town of Fife, Scotland, a large puddle has formed. An investigation is underway, and so far they have not determined what it is, but they know that it's definitely not pineapple juice. (laughs) I can see now why you didn't want me to read that one. (laughs) What the fuck? Is that or is that not the greatest story beat that could ever appear? Oh, that is wonderful. <clears throat> not pineapple juice, though, huh? No, for sure. They they made very clear to state that. They don't know what it is, <laughs> but by God, it's not pineapple juice. Oh, in, the middle of the ro- in the middle of the road in the town of Fife, Scotland. In the middle of the road? Why would it be pineapple juice? Well, I, I did some additional research, and there is actually an answer to that. I could tell you, or I could leave the mystery for you, whichever you want. Oh, demystify this for me. Okay, so there is a there's a dairy up the road, and they thought that the puddle was caused by a burst pipe of pineapple juice that goes under that goes from the dairy under the town. There's a they they. They pipe pineapple juice into this dairy or something, or there's like a tank of pineapple juice, but they're like, well, this, this big puddle of pineapple juice might've come from, well, okay. So they see this top, they see this big puddle that is just spontaneously forming and they're like, well, it could be pineapple juice from the dairy. It's like, (laughs) well, that doesn't. That doesn't help me. That doesn't answer any questions. (laughs) It just creates more questions. But (laughs) but they they tested the contents of the puddle, and they know that it's definitely not pineapple juice. So at least we've got the crack detectives of Scotland on the case. I want to be a a cop in Fife so bad. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Oh, you set your own rules, your own agenda. All right. The city of Kyle, Texas, is calling for Kyles everywhere to gather at an annual festival in order to set a Guinness World Record. The festival, called the Kyle Pie in the Sky Hot Air Balloon Festival, is held annually on Labor Day weekend. They want to gather the most Kyles in one place. 
They're even bribing the Kyles, offering a free pass to the festival and a free t-shirt. This gambit is unlikely to pay off, however, as hot air balloons have no drywall for the Kyles to punch, so how would they even communicate? Friend of the show David Rush has set another world record, slicing 85 kiwis with a katana sword in one minute while standing on a balance board. He does this to promote uh, science education, and I don't know about you all, but I feel smarter already. (laughs) I mean, ignore the thick glasses. It's the guy slashing the kiwi that makes me feel like a scientist. I see that, and I think, you know what? I am going to apply to MIT, by God. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad we revisited this guy. He's he's on here, like, it feels like, every few weeks doing something silly for STEM. I check on him every so often just to see if he's broken any new world records, and I'm never disappointed. <laughs> nice. All right. Washington, D.C., a town still recovering from the cicada infestation, is now reeling as new a new pest has shown up. They're called itch mites, and they cause red, itchy, painful welts. They travel on the wind and bite people, causing them to scratch, which often leads to secondary infections. When we tried to reach the mites for comment, they were largely silent on the matter, as it's a well-known fact that snitch mites get stitch mites. Greg? Go to jail. A piece of cake from the wedding of Prince Charles and Princess Diana has sold at auction for more than $25,000. It's a lemon poppy seed genoise with buttercream and adrenochrome frosting. I love a good adrenochrome joke. All right, enough about the news. It's time for main news. So before I can tell you about the Fermi paradox, I got to tell you about the Drake equation. So the Drake equation was created by uh, this scientist of yore, uh, Frank Drake, who said, okay, if you, you know, take the number of... You used of- to call me on the cell. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, it's it's actually the same guy, amazingly. He looks terrific, and he's he's a very... Uh, he's a renaissance man. Is that the, the lyric, you used to call me on... No, it's used to call me on my, my cell phone, isn't it? Yes. Or Once sh- again, Gene Person, proven he is hip and with it. Well, luckily for you, it's hip to be square. But anyway, the Drake equation is you you plug in a bunch of variables about the universe, like the number of stars in the universe, the number of those stars that have planets, etc. and so on. And you can arrive at an approximate number of how many intelligent species there are in the galaxy. Hmm. If there's one thing we've learned about space, it's that there's a lot of it. There's a just a huge number of stars and it turns out that a lot more of them than we used to think also have planets almost all of them and mm-hmm. about one in five of of those planets have liquid water and so on and so forth so we're fairly sure that there should be like millions of intelligent species out there right and but, we're just talking about the observable universe right now right right because exactly like, in theory, the universe goes on infinitely, so it'd be an infinite number of planets. Right, but it, the first variable you have to plug into the uh, Drake equation is the number of stars, and you can only go on the number of stars you can see. Yeah, gotcha, but, okay. So, But this leads us to the Fermi paradox, which is, if there's all these millions of intelligent species out there, where the hell is everybody? They're over at Drake's house. Right, well, I mean, he throws amazing parties... Right, and uh, he also once circumnavigated the globe. They're all. <laughs> that was nice. That was really good. I I don't feel good about that one. That was pretty lame, but I'm okay with it. <laughs> okay, well, they're all part of Drake's entourage. Indeed, but um, the thing is, uh, we should be tripping over at the very least the remains of other intelligent species. You know, artifacts and and big pieces of stellar engineering or whatever but of course we haven't found anything so that's sort of the central paradox that uh, we struggle with is that they have to be out there and yet they clearly are not what does that have to do with this is going to be an interesting one tying these two things together okay so first and foremost i should probably mention that building blasters was largely a failure I, uh, I guess I never caught on, and I don't understand why, because my brother and I had multiple sets of these, and we absolutely loved them. Building blasters were a construction toy, kind of like Lego or Kinex, but I guess more akin to constructs, 
since the pieces resembled actual steel girders. The Building Blasters kit allowed you to construct a building, in most cases several designs of, of the building using the different pieces, and also included one extra piece. That extra piece was some kind of device to trigger the demolition of the structure that you built. They didn't always work perfectly, but the structures toppled and it was a lot of fun. My brother George and I would construct elaborate, destructible set pieces for our G.I. Joes and Ninja Turtles. We'd come up with detailed storylines for the buildings and why they were on the verge of collapse. We'd build all, all of the various designs outlined in the instructions first, then come up with all manner of crazy structure after the fact. The kits were fully compatible with each other, so you could use pieces from one structure in another kit. Structures available for sale included a rocket launcher, a fuel depot, a suspense bridge, and a power tower. Every target the aspiring eco-terrorist needs. Honestly though, regular toys break. Structures you put so much work into sometimes fall apart. Making that part of the fun was a very smart move by Kenner in my opinion, and I'm sad it didn't pay off for them. So what do these two things have to do with each other? Well, first, I want to say before we start making connections, I'd never heard of Building Blasters. It sounds amazing. Yeah, it really was a fun little kit. I would have loved to have played with something like that, and I I never even knew they existed. So I don't know it, why we don't know about them. And it's not like Domino Rally, where the pieces were all really crappy and wouldn't stay together very well. These these structures would actually stand up pretty well on their own until you uh, until you set off the chain reaction. See, so there's there's a paradox already that kind of connects to the Fermi paradox, which is these toys are great. They should be everywhere. And yet they're right. not. <laughs> right. That's I mean, that is probably the strongest one we're going to come up with. But let's keep digging. Well, there's also the, this concept of destructibility and impermanence in the structures that you build. Mm -hmm. Maybe... It's, it's just the fact that the things that we build fall down. I mean, there could be a time gap of all these these different civilizations of, if there's a gap of 100,000 years between this civilization and this civilization, in cosmic time, that's nothing. But it's certainly time enough for everything that you've ever built to fall down and, and be completely undetectable. I'm going to throw something out at you. And mm -hmm. I don't know if this is just a little too much of a downer. Or what? But what if the problem is that sentience begets self-destruction? And well, so before any of these other civilizations are able to reach a point where they can build something with any kind of permanence um, that would be identifiable to us uh, or reach out and discover something that, that we have left behind, they've already eradicated themselves. Well, that's actually... Um, because, of course, a lot of people have proposed answers to the Fermi Paradox, and mm -hmm. that's a very common one. Um, they, call okay. it, they call it Great Filter Theory. It's the idea that there are certain points at the development of a species where they're liable to wipe themselves out. Um, mm -hmm. Like, for example, uh, nuclear where, weapons is a filter. Well, I was going to say where we are now is, seems like <laughs> right. one of those yeah. points. Climate change, yeah, potentially, because you, you get to a point as a species where you have the power to affect your environment to a degree that you couldn't before, but mm -hmm. you're not, like, your your brain, your understanding of your place in the universe hasn't really evolved, so you have mm -hmm. power that you can't possibly wield responsibly, you're like a three-year-old with a gun, so that's that's a potential filter. There could be other technologies that become, like, you know, weird dark energy stuff or like things we don't even know about that sure. could be so destructive. It could be war, you know, could just be, could just be bad luck. Sometimes planets just fall out of their orbit and go spinning off into space. Sure. Sometimes um, you're, you're in the blast zone when there's a supernova in the neighborhood. Right. You, know, you so, get pelted with that kind of radiation. You're not going to make it. Right, or, you know, meteors, stuff like that, R.I.P. dinosaurs. Uh, sure. There's there's all kinds of hazards that could imperil the civilization that would mean that whatever the number is that could theoretically arise, that they're, they're cutting themselves off 
before they get to that point where they can communicate with people. But if we're talking a number in the millions, that seems kind of unlikely. Well, the just happenstance would be responsible for all of that. And the other option, too, is uh, we kind of assume that more advanced civilizations would build bigger and, and more powerful and more obvious technologies like, you mm -hmm. know, giants, giant uh, space stations that we could spot with our telescopes or what have you. But it's it's uh, equally possible, maybe even more likely that the surviving civilizations are less obtrusive. They're right. having less of an impact on their environment. In fact, the same thing has happened to us. We used to throw radio waves out into space like crazy because mm -hmm. radio was our main means of long distance communication. Uh, we put out a lot less radio into space now because we have better technologies that allow you just to send signals directly and you right. can't see those from space. So, so that's all really interesting. Let's see if we can find any more bridges to these subject of building blasters. Well, let me ask you this. When you destroyed your building blasters, does that mm -hmm. increase the likelihood of them breaking so that they can't be reused? They weren't super breakable in that way, no. So, I mean, unless you were really abusive to the little sort of hook ends on the eye bars they were going to be fine. You were going to be able to construct that building over and over and over, probably, you know, thousands and thousands of times. Because my question, I guess, is like civilizations, does building blasters somehow contain the seeds of its own destruction? I, I mean, don't... It, it does literally contain the seeds of its own destruction. Right. But... I don't, I don't think that that's the case really, because it was a, it was a pretty strong toy. And at least... I don't know that the marketing was really strong for them. So I think the marketing was partially responsible for their demise. Um, but for whatever reason, it didn't sell. We bought, I think we had every kit there was. So I know like we were on it when we found those. We really, really liked playing with them. Well, how did you find out about them? Was it on a commercial or did you just see it, them in a store? It, I think we just saw them in a, it might've been in the Sears catalog or something. So they were using an obsolete technology to try to communicate, which right. you wouldn't see nowadays. Right. So you, this is, you put something kind of, in the Sears catalog. You're, 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 you're going to need a, you know, time machine. <laughs> right. This is kind of like us using um, radio telescopes to search for signals from other civilizations. Mm -hmm. We're we're basically trying to find a copy of the Sears catalog with, you know, the latest spring fashions in it. And that's crazy because they're not there anymore. Right. So we need to find out what is the alien eBay where mm. we can find their building blasters. OK, well, we'll get right on that. I mean, I didn't mean you and me. We're podcasters. We're already doing important work. Yeah, the most important work. Oh, for sure. For sure. For sure. So do you feel like we've we've uh, cracked this nut? Yeah, I feel like we've done pretty well with this, honestly. As, I mean, this this was a really fun conversation. We got to, to dive into some philosophical things. We got to talk about the bleak end of the human race, which is always a delight. So I, I actually might buy a set of those. I None of the kids I know were young enough to enjoy that, but I'm old enough to enjoy it. The suspension bridge was a really fun one. The rocket launcher was really fun. Well, how much do these kits run you anymore these days? I The, the ones that I saw for sale were between like $25 and $40. And then the power tower, which was the biggest one, was I think the lowest price I saw was seventy four. Hmm. How tall is the power tower? It was pretty tall. All right. Well, maybe that's the one to go with then. If you're it looked gonna... like a big radio tower. Oh, is that another connection? Maybe. Like, like radio telescopes, radio towers. Yeah, I mean, this thing looked like it could have been something SETI was trying to use. See, I feel like we're we're in the movie Contact where all these weird little coincidences turn out to have been these crazy bank shots by the aliens to get us to communicate with them. Yeah. So maybe I'll buy one and, and see if E.T. shows up. All right. 
All right, let's uh, let's move on to breaking news. A Kenosha, Wisconsin woman was reportedly using the laser sight on her friend's handgun as a cat toy. So right out of the gate, that's an incredibly bad idea. Uh, she then pointed the red dot at her friend's leg, which is a dick move in two ways. Because one, you should never point a gun at something you absolutely do not want to destroy. And two, best case scenario, that cat would have clawed the fuck out of her friend on his way up that leg. And of course, the gun went off. Police responded to the noise complaint, but the friend was hiding, and they actually had to play a little game of hide-and-seek to find him, despite his gunshot wound, before applying a tourniquet and taking him to the hospital. Why was he hiding, you ask? Because bond conditions had been set that should have prevented him from owning a weapon. The woman may also face charges including reckless endangerment, unlawful use of a firearm, and solicitation, since she was clearly gunning for pussy. Well, this goes back to what we've said over and over again on this show. Guns are definitely toys. <laughs> That's the opposite of the message, but... Oh, is that yeah. not where we landed on that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Guns are definitely toys. Okay. Okay. Well, you know what this actually reminded me of is that uh, Lego Glock. Did you see that thing from a few weeks ago? Everyone was up in arms about it, so to yeah. speak. Yeah. 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 That was, uh, that's one of the worst things I've ever seen. So yeah, no, just uh, take your guns out uh, and uh, just, you know, play with them, taunt cats with them, shoot your friends, whatever. It's fine. This is America. Yeah. Do what you want. Yeah. We don't want to step on anyone's freedoms. Oh, God, no. I mean, if if you don't have the freedom to draw a bead on your friend for a joke, then mm -hmm. then we might as well all just be living in Nazi Germany. Right. Heaven forbid someone makes you, you know, not point guns at people no, or say, you know, wear a mask or something. Well, and I'll tell you this, if I don't have a gun pointed at me at all times, I feel less free because, <laughs> because that I can look at that person pointing the gun at my head and say, this person is exercising their freedom. Right. And I, I salute them and a single tear goes down my cheek um, from love of my country, but also fear because that gun could go off at any time. Ladies and gentlemen, Greg Person... Nay, Greg LaPierre. <laughs> <laughs> Super patriot. <laughs> How about your breaking news story? Okay, so this is one, uh, this had to be rushed to the presses, and by the presses, I mean my phone, um, because it, it just came out today, basically, mm -hmm. that uh, Nathan J. Robinson, the owner of Current Affairs magazine, fired his entire staff for organizing. Now, that's where Maury Povich got his start, right? Actually, this is a different Current Affairs. <laughs> I, um, I know. I know. <laughs> current Affairs is a magazine about leftist politics, socialism, and labor issues. It's owned by Nathan J. Robinson, who is a Willy Wonka cosplayer and British accent effector. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, he's often been accused of being a fake leftist because he says he's a socialist who hates Marx, which for those of what? you. Yeah, no, nah, he, he says, oh, I'm a, I'm a socialist, but I reject Marx, which is kind of like being a biology teacher at a Bible college who rejects Darwin. You're right. You're basically that saying doesn't make any sense at all. Right. You're like, oh, I'm full of shit. I'm a fraud. And, and mm -hmm. that's exactly what he is. He actually finally proved it for good because the magazine staff who had assumed that uh, this this leftist socialist magazine they were writing for uh, would be willing to put their money where their mouth is, they came to him with a plan to restructure the magazine as a uh, democratically led uh, worker co-op. And he mm -hmm. responded like a boss by firing everyone. <laughs> so now listen, I don't want to be one sided here. Everyone's going to get the chance to tell their side of the story. So sure. I would like, if you uh, don't mind to read the statement that he released in his defense, 
And just to be extra fair, I'm going to read it exactly the way that he would read it. Okay. The organization has been heading slowly for some sort of reckoning where it was going to have to be made clear once and for all. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) May I, may I please continue to read the statement in the manner in which it would be appropriate? Please. And I was in denial about the fact that the answer is, I think I should be on top of the org chart with everyone else selected by me and reporting to me. I let current affairs build up into a sort of egalitarian community of friends while knowing in my heart that I still thought of it as my project over which I should have control. Now... This motherfucker moved to Florida when he was six, by the way. He's choosing to have that accent. Okay. Anyway, it goes to show that bosses are bosses, and they will talk all kinds of shit until it's time to democratize the enterprise. And then they'll show their boss stripes every time. So if you want power in your workplace, don't ask your boss for it. Don't expect him to go along with it. You've got to demand it or create it from the start because Willy Wonka may seem like a whimsical childlike genius who just wants to add some magic to the world, but the Oompa Loompas can't leave the factory. Boom. Boom. Mic drop. And folks, if you don't know why I keep referring to uh, Nathan J. Robinson with Willy Wonka references, just Google a picture of him. Do yourself a favor and and find a a clip of him. Riddler looking motherfucker. (laughs) No, he, he he looks like a, a miniature Matthew Lesko. Right. <laughs> he, he looks like he wants to tell you how government programs will get you free money. Right. Which, as as the head of a socialist magazine, he kind of does want to do that. <laughs> I still can't get over that accent, man. Yeah, I, I really killed it. I really nailed his <laughs> essence. You sounded like Scott Thompson playing the Queen. It was beautiful. That's pretty much the vibe I was going for, actually. Or uh, so. or even better, Mark McKinney playing uh, Prince Charles. <laughs> Mumsy! <laughs> All right. It's time for sports! All right. Well, this week, I want to talk to you about soccer. Uh, soccer is an easy game to fix. So easy, I don't even have to do anything this week because it's already been fixed by Indonesians. Who play a game called, um, and excuse me if I uh, mispronounce this, uh, Sipak Bola Api, which translates to flaming football. Uh, they play mm-hmm. during Ramadan. The rules are exactly the same as soccer, except the ball is a coconut soaked in kerosene and set on fire. <laughs> Neat! Now, I love this because it simultaneously solves my two biggest problems while watching a soccer match. Knowing where the ball is and giving a shit what happens to it. <laughs> so, there you go. If if you're thinking, God, I wish soccer was worth watching, just watch CPAC Bola Api. It rules. All right. That I mean, it sounds fun. Who, who doesn't love a flaming soccer ball? Nobody. That's my point. Like, yeah. go watch it. It's fantastic. Our Anna Pal in this week's creature feature looks like he might have been hit in the face with a flaming soccer ball. So for this week's creature feature, I thought I'd dig around in our own backyard. In the uh, northern parts of North America, underground, you'll find an interesting mammal that looks like something from an alien world. They're called star-nosed moles, and they look a lot like a regular mole that had a live firecracker go off on their face. The unique snout of the star-nosed mole explodes forward in a starburst shape. It almost looks like little tendrils or tentacles. The structure is covered in Elmer's organs, which are very sensitive touch receptors, and they help the mole feel its way around. Because of the Elmer's organs, the star-nosed mole could actually detect earthquakes. The moles are functionally blind, but apparently they have a good sense of smell and are even able to smell underwater. Fortunately, unlike previous entries in the segment, the star-nosed mole is in no way threatened. Unfortunately... Unlike previous entries in this segment, the star-nosed mole is also in no way cute. They really are kind of horrible looking. Yeah, I mean, 
like the the descriptor that keeps coming to mind when I see an image of a star nosed mole is grotesque. They're they're flayed. Their faces are flayed open, and it's horrible. Yeah. Also, when I when I read your notes earlier this week, uh, I didn't know what Elmer's organs were, and so I thought it said they're covered in Elmer's organs or they're covered in Elmer's organs. And I was like, wait, who's Elmer? What happened? Did I skip a sentence? <laughs> what's what's going on? So, distressing animals, and I hope they stay underground where they belong. Yeah. Yeah. All right, it's time for the emotional weather. This week's weather, gratitude, platitude, and magnitude. I'll go ahead and lead off my story for gratitude. Despite the world being what it is, I have a lot to be grateful for. I have an incredible son, a beautiful and understanding wife, and a co-host that makes me laugh a lot. But for this emotional weather story, I wanted to express my gratitude to every listener of this podcast. Whether or not you write in, whether or not you subscribe or leave a review, I appreciate there are people other than us who are enjoying the show. And we've said before, we would do the show whether whether there was an audience or not. But it's so much more fun and it's more rewarding when we have that audience. So thank you for listening. If you ever get the inclination... It's been a while since we wrote a haiku, and we don't want to get rusty. Send us an email. Give us fodder for the next bit. And do remember, though, that unless you subscribe, you're not actually married to us. Yeah, yeah. You're outside the circle until you subscribe. Yeah, it is that subscription that gives you, you know, privileges. Subscription to a podcast is the most sacred bond that you can enter, though. So don't take it lightly. Really think about it. Yes. Bros from Brose, I do. Now, for my gratitude weather, I'm not going to lie. This one is tough for me at the moment. I do try to make a habit of gratitude because I think it's the antidote to the disappointment that pervades existence as a sentient being. But lately, Mm -hmm. my efforts have been feeling a bit forced. In the end, though, I'd say if nothing else, I'm always grateful for impermanence. The fact that everything is always changing because whatever happens... The next moment will at least be different, which means that there's a chance, an opportunity for things to be better. So thanks, impermanence. Yay. Yay. My my platitude story. Everything happens for a reason. Sometimes things happen for a reason. The Lord works in mysterious ways. These common platitudes all have about the same meaning, and that meaning is that your suffering is in the service of something good. Is it true, though? Ah, it's true that everything happens for a reason. That reason is that things happen. Whether or not you believe in the Lord, does he work in mysterious ways? Even when there's a great big book, people love to cite about the ways in which he works. When you say this kind of shit, you're just minimizing or subconsciously invalidating someone else's suffering. Don't do it. If you see someone hurting, remind them that it's okay to feel the way they do. Ask if there's any way you can help or if they'd like to talk about it, and respect them if the answer is no. I know it's hard, but deny that platitude programming, because it's not going to help them, and it's definitely not going to help you either. Well, Gene, for my platitude weather, I don't want to lay a bunch of garbage on you, so I'll just say this. It's always darkest before the dawn, and when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Every cloud has a silver lining, and it's an ill wind that blows no one some good. So let a smile be your umbrella, And when life gives you lemons, shut the fuck up and eat your lemons. Because the day is coming when fresh fruit and vitamin C will be nothing but bittersweet memories. Okay, for a second I thought that was going to be composed entirely of platitudes. (laughs) But uh, I like the direction you took it. Yeah, I I thought of uh, going that way, but I found a, a different angle I liked. That's great. Okay, for my magnitude story, in other news, pop, pop. And for my magnitude story... Pop, 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 pop. pop. (laughs) As you know, (laughs) stupid. (laughs) As you know, every week our investigative team uncovers a detailed and harrowing story on food crime. This week, Greg Person has a story. This is another one I had to uh, make some quick changes to because as long as we're already talking about labor issues tonight, I wanted to use the food crime spot to highlight a different kind of food crime. The exploitation of workers by the Nabisco company and their parent company, Mondelay. Uh, Their workers are on strike right now, 
uh, because the company was planning to rob them of their overtime and outsource their jobs. So until they win, the anchor person's household, and if you didn't know already, me and Jean, we do live in the same house. We share bunk beds and uh, the anchor person's household is not going to cross the snack picket line. Fortunately, all their products or junk food were better off without. But until they win, we're not going to be buying any Nabisco or Mondelez products. If you want to join us, you can find a list of Mondelez and Nabisco products online so you know which ones to avoid. I did look at one of those lists when you mentioned this story. Uh, and uh, the only product that I use with any regularity is Newton's. And honestly, I like the Nature's Bakery uh, version of Fig Bars better anyway so i'll just have those for me the the nature's bakery bars especially the uh whole grain ones mm -hmm. they they really live up to the reputation of fruit and cake a lot better than newtons do yeah yeah because i mean those little th the newtons they're not cakey they're they're too dry mm -hmm. they're very grainy but but these ones actually do taste like oh it's a little cake with fruit filling inside it's they're wonderful. Yeah, I've noticed that the Newton cake, the cake portion of the Newton, I don't think they used to do this. So I wonder if this is maybe a little bit of uh, shrinkflation. The cake portion of the Fig Newton has a tendency to stick to stick to your teeth and the roof of your mouth and stuff. Yeah, it's so gluey. Ugh. It didn't used to do that, but it definitely does now. Anyway, let's move on to the podcast shopping network. This week on the Podcast Shopping Network, we're again straddling a line with our resident food crime expert, but these devices don't produce a specific kind of food, so I think we're okay. They're called fridge balls, and they're little green BB-8 looking bad boys that you place in your fridge. The fridge balls are supposed to keep your fruits and veggies from spoiling. Fridge balls feature an ABS exterior free from BPA and a potassium permanganate filter. It helps to eliminate foul odors and helps fresh foods last up to three times longer. The manufacturer claims that supermarkets and restaurants have known about this technology and have been using it for decades. Which makes me wonder why refrigerator manufacturers haven't built the technology into the fridges you buy. But maybe they just don't have the balls. The fridge balls supposedly absorb the ethylene gas produced by fruits and vegetables, which helps them stay fresh much longer, allowing you to save money, eat healthier, shop less, etc. There's just one problem with fridge balls. They don't actually work. Those greens, those fruits and veg, they're going to rot at about the same schedule they would have, whether or not you have some little green mystery balls in the crisper with them. So basically, you're buying a decoration for your fridge. And there are better decorations than a handful of little green wiffle balls. Fridge balls retailed for nine ninety nine, I think. I I love the angle that they take with this, and a lot of you know, crappy fake products will do this, where they're like, "Here's the secret that the manufacturers of this product don't want you to know, because it would make their product better." It's like, are you? Do you understand how products work? Right. If like, <laughs> if, if if the fridge manufacturers. Why on earth wouldn't they include the technology in their refrigerators? They would sell so many more. You give me a fridge, a refrigerator that where the vegetables don't spoil. You would make a mint on that. Right, right. You could be like, hey, we created this new stay fresh fridge. It's got, what was it? Manganese permanganate? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, potassium permanganate. There you go. Potassium permanganate. The fridge is $10,000, but you'll never have to throw out a head of lettuce again. You'd be like, shut up and take my money. Right. Because the the shame that you feel when you throw out the wilted vegetables that are the physical manifestation of the gap between the person you are and the person you wish you were. Right. It's not a lot well, of, there's not a lot of, you know, more terrible feelings than that. Right, because you had the best of intentions when you bought that produce, and then you ate lean cuisines until they rotted. When you stick your hands in a pile of goo <laughs> that two weeks ago was a head of lettuce. <laughs> oh, that is fantastic. <laughs> All right. It is time for State Up, our weekly review of all 50 states in the Union. 
This week's state, Minnesota. My first fact about Minnesota, the gross domestic product of the state of Minnesota is that ass. Despite its name, most of their sodas are regular size. Minnesota was founded in the mid-1800s when a handful of large Scandinavian families were dared to be double dog Lutheran. (laughs) For about 1,200 years, Minnesota was part of one of the largest and most complex civilizations in North America. But now they have Garrison Keillor, so... (laughs) If, If someone in Minnesota offers you a salad, understand that it may contain mayonnaise, marshmallows, American cheese, lunch meat, corn chips, hard boiled eggs, or chocolate chip cookies. Also understand that it may not contain any vegetables whatsoever. Midwestern salad is like when you are just drunk as hell at a buffet at 11 o'clock at night. Except cold. Yes, it is. (laughs) (laughs) You're just like, I'm going to put some Snickers bars. Got to get some hard boiled eggs. I need some some kimchi. Yeah, kimchi. That sounds good. And, And definitely mayo. Lots of mayo. And we'll just put it in the fridge for 24 hours. <laughs> Minnesota is also now currently on fire. Welcome to the party, pal. Yeah, not a club you want to be in, but uh, it's a club we're in every year. Well, I tell you, I actually I got a little bit of, of fire snobbishness about this. Because uh-huh. I read a, I read about a uh, wildfire in Minnesota, and so I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So I click on it. The fire that they're trying to contain right now is a thousand acres. Uh huh. The fire that's like six <laughs> miles away from me right now is eight thousand acres. Right. <laughs> I was going to say a thousand acres. I mean, that's not necessarily small, but it, that is definitely not a a large forest fire compared to the ones that we've seen. No, that's not a western style forest fire. Yeah, we the, do it. The, we we do it up big over here. The uh, the bootleg fire that's about 30 miles away from both of us in different directions. Mm-hmm. That one is 413,000 acres. Mhm. Yeah. Just for perspective. Yeah. So, good luck with your 1000 acre wildfire in Minnesota. <laughs> I'm sure it's terrifying. With all the lakes up there, you'd think they'd have plenty of water to put it out. Well, see, that's the that's the trouble is that all the thousand lakes are are on the other side of. No, I, I have no idea actually. <laughs> right, it doesn't matter. It, <laughs> it's an immaterial <laughs> point. All right, our final segment tonight, as every week, is person to person and person. It's where we share your valuable feedback with our audience. So, my buddy Tim, who was on the show a couple of episodes back, sent me a story while I was in California, and I forgot about it in sort of the rush to get back and everything. The story covered how the 2021 Tokyo Olympics turned smartphones and laptops into medals for the victors. I've decided to use that as a subject for a haiku and a limerick to stay in practice. So, my haiku. One less podcatcher, one more shiny gold trophy. Can you hear me now? And the limerick A young man from the IOC wanted to do public good, you see. Though he gave all the folks COVID and heat strokes, he made prizes from landfills. Yippee! Those are great. Tim, I tried to write one, but it was really hard, and I gave up. (laughs) It took a lot of effort to to get those two written, uh, but I I feel good about them. As always, I'd like to give a a shout-out to our bros at the Bros A podcast. Wonderful guys who have a lot of fun, get together, drink wine and laugh about all manner of crazy stuff reenact antiques roadshow segments it's pretty great it's a great show you should you should listen to it also a shout out to our voiceover artist adam west who you can find on fiverr and at his website awestprod.com absolutely the best and most professional part of the show folks that's all the news the persons have for you tonight Would you like a haiku written about the topic of your choice send your topic and the anchor persons might just make that happen Gene and Greg love your feedback, and there are so many ways to give it to them. Send them an email, anchorpersonspodcast at gmail.com. Find them on Twitter, at anchorpersons. 
or visit their website, anchorpersonspodcast.com, where you can leave an audio message via SpeakPipe, as well as find full episodes of the show, blog posts, and more. Please be sure to like, subscribe, and review the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or the podcatcher of your choice, or simply tell a friend. Until next time. This is Gene Person saying, you should always end a comedy set with a callback. And this is Greg Person saying, Oompa Loompa, doopity doo. Good night. Wrong, sir. Wrong. Under Section 37B of the contract signed by them, it states quite clearly that all offers shall become null and void if, and you could read it for yourself in this photostatic copy, I, the undersigned, shall forfeit all rights, privileges, and licenses herein, and herein contained, etc., etc., fax mentis incendium gloria cultum, etc., etc., memo bis modo fabricatio. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. You tried to organize a co-op, you bumped into the executive floor, which now has to be washed and sterilized, so you get nothing. You lose. Good day, sir.